another uh, woman artist from the Baroque period is Elizabeth or Elisabetta Serrani. Uh, she comes from Bologna. She pretty much spends her life in Bologna. And as you can see, she dies very young uh, in her 27th year. Elisabetta Serrani was the daughter of Giovanni Serrani, who was a pupil of Guido Reni. Uh, Guido Reni died in 1642, and he was uh, one of the most famous painters of Bologna and one of the most famous painters of the Baroque period. Serrani became very, very famous in her own lifetime. She had her struggles, and we'll talk about those. Um, but one of the reasons was that one of the reasons that Serrani was able um, to make a name for herself in her own day was because she had a very um, powerful uh, person to promote her. And this was the Count Carlo Cesare Malavisia. Malavisio wrote a history of Bolognese painters, the Fulcina Pinture, and so he's kind of a, some people say he's a Vasari for Bologna, but he's also encouraging uh, a contemporary artist. And he encouraged and praised Elisabetta, and he says that he persuaded her father to teach her painting. Now, one of the things that's interesting about uh, Serrani is she keeps a list of her painting, uh, the notes of painting. And in this list, it's not just a list of you know, Madonna and Child, such and such. She really gives descriptions of them. She mentions the names of the patrons and who is portrayed in them. She dates them um, you know, she, for every year. You know, she writes the works that she created. Um, this is just amazing because it's done from, she died in 1665, so uh, from six, she, she died in 1665 and she's keeping this list from 1655. She's 17 years old when she starts this list. And in only 10 years, she records 190 paintings. Now we haven't found all of those, um, but sometimes they find things and she uh, very often signs and dates her works. Now she had a particular problem. Her father was very selfish. Uh, remember that wives and children, particularly female children, were chattels to their parent, to their father or their husbands. And so um, even though her father was a talented painter, uh, he really, he, he didn't have to work. He could just have her paint and he could take all her earnings, which is perfectly legal. So it has been suggested that she may have sold paintings that were not on the list in order to support herself and her mother because her father was just taking it all and not even letting them have uh, what they needed uh, to live. Um, that There are a number of paintings that are attributed to her that don't have her signature. So they may be those paintings or they may be false attributions, we don't know. One of the tribulations that she had was here she is a kind of virtuoso turning out these pictures uh, quite quickly, as you can see, and probably for economic reasons uh, because her father wants that money. So he's pushing her to paint, paint, paint. And also, because she's got to paint some extras on the slide just so she can live. Um, but her work was good enough that people say, oh, it can't be a woman, can't be a young lady. Um, her male rivals accused her of not painting her own paintings. You know, her father did it for her. You know, it was just a gimmick that they say it's by her. Um, and so what she had to do is prove herself. Uh, generally people, you know, male artists don't usually have to prove that they're capable of painting. And uh, she got very prominent witnesses and uh, she painted a portrait of Prince Leonard Leonardo of Tuscany before the witnesses, you know, and she just showed how proficient she was and what a virtuoso and that she's perfectly capable of painting uh, her painting herself. And after that, of course, that had to pretty much silence the critics. Um, the works that are on her list are pretty high quality. There are some things that are sometimes weak when she's in her earliest works. And remember, she's had to turn these things out really fast. Um, 
some of the works that are attributed to her are not of the high, as highest quality. And so it's possible that people are just saying, oh, here we've got this Bolognese work. Uh, it's a woman, since women are weak, we'll give it to her. Or it's possible that some of them are the works that uh, she didn't list because she didn't want her father to know about. Um, you know, but maybe some of them aren't really hers. I'll show you a few of these that are uh, signed and dated, and then we'll show you some that uh, you know, maybe are not. Um, this uh, painting is in the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. And it illustrates the style and approach uh, that Serrani was very uh, well known for. Uh, her style is based on Guido Reni. It's what we sometimes call the classical Baroque, only she has a much uh, softer, uh, more Oh, what's the word? Is it sometimes, sometimes even a more melting uh, uh, application of paint. Um, it's sometimes said that she has a sweet sensibility uh, with you know, quiet, restrained emotion. You have very beautiful figures and, and great tenderness. Um, these are, I keep mentioning Guido Reni, so I thought I'd bring in a, picture, a few pictures by Guido Reni. Uh, and you can see some of those same qualities in his work, for example, the tenderness of St. Joseph, perhaps, uh, looking at the Christ child. Um, one of the things that happened with Guido Reni's reputation is he often had these uh, quite emotive figures with, with the um, uh, feeling of uh, love and tenderness. And in the 20th century, they decided they didn't like things like that, that they considered them sentimental, and so Guido Reni's reputation, um, which had been extremely high, uh, was reduced. And since Serrani also paints things of loving tenderness, uh, people who want art to be troubled and uh, dour <laughs> uh, or nutsy and crazy or whatever, uh, sometimes don't see the virtues in uh, that particular style. Um, this very, very beautiful picture of the Madonna and Child, or the Virgin and Child, in the National uh, Museum of Women in the Arts represents uh, some of that of her style. Um, there's some pretty um, loose brushwork going on, particularly in the sleeve. Uh, there's a great deal of simplicity. I mean, this could almost be a, any mother and child. Uh, it's not Mary as uh, Queen of Heaven uh, in regal garments. There's uh, very little pattern. Uh, some, the beautiful uh, rose garland that Christ is crowning Mary with is not exactly a queenly crown. So there's something very uh, tender about it, something uh, that people can relate to. And these were very, very popular, and so she turned out uh, many pictures of the Madonna and Child. Um, and not always just the Madonna and Child as well. Here we see St. Anthony of Padua, who was a Franciscan. Uh, adoring the Christ child. You know, he has a vision of the Christ child. And we usually see statues of St. Anthony uh, holding a lily and holding the Christ child. About this time, uh, about 1663, her style, uh, she sometimes paints with greater contrasts of light and shade. Uh, she's you know, still very young, but uh, she's in her 20s. Um, but she's uh, turning out very beautiful paintings, as you can see. One of the paintings that uh, has become particularly well known and associated with uh, Elisabetta Sarini, Sarani uh, is Portia wounding her thigh. Now this is a classical subject. Uh, the literary source for this is Plutarch's Lives. So we have a classical source. Uh, Sarani is from Bologna. Bologna is a university city. Uh, not that she would have gone to university, uh, but she probably was quite well educated and uh, obviously educated enough to uh, be able to know this story, which is not one that you know, just everyone knows. Um, the story is about Portia, the wife of Brutus, and this is Brutus, uh, who was one of the assassins uh, that killed uh, Julius Caesar. And remember that when they killed Julius Caesar, what they were doing was trying to protect the Roman Republic from a dictator. Uh, so it was, uh, they believed it was a very patriotic thing to do. Well, Brutus was obviously troubled about something and hiding something from his wife, Portia. And he wouldn't tell her what was going on. And she did not want to be um, 
you know, kept in the position of not knowing what was going on with her husband. She wanted to convince him that she had uh, the virtues of a man. Notice the word virtue has as its uh, root vir, or vir, which means man, you know, male being. Um, so she's going to show her heroic virtue. Uh, she takes a, a dagger and stabs her thigh and does not cry out. Says, you know, I can withstand pain. I am not some weak woman. Uh, you know, I want to be included. And Brutus reveals himself to him. When Brutus, of course, is killed, Portia actually commits suicide by swallowing burning coals. This is a scene that is almost never shown in art. Uh, as far as I know, this is the only time. And it has been um, it has been given a feminist reading in today's society. Uh, the idea that uh, Sarani is showing how powerful women can be. Uh, 17th century reading would also be a reading here of someone with morality and character, uh, and that you know Portia has a, perhaps a, a, a universal um, meaning rather than uh, just the power of women. Let's take a look at the picture itself. Um, she has in the forefront um, the large figure of Portia um, in just beautiful, gorgeous clothes, uh, rich reds, uh, golden brocade, uh, striking blue in her boot. So these very well, rich colors, and that's uh, contrasted to the, the, the pale flesh, uh, which of course was very uh, uh, fashionable. That's what a woman should be. And so she's doing her manly deed, her uh, powerful deed of actually wounding herself and showing her strength of character uh, in the foreground. In the background, we see women involved in traditional women's activities. Uh, they seem to be perhaps uh, uh, involved with uh, spinning or embroidery or something like that. Um, and there's this contrast then of what, what people, you know, women are supposed to be doing, what you think of women being doing, and what Portia is doing. That she wants to come, um, not to be regulated to that back room, as it were, uh, but to be in the full confidence of her husband as uh, his, his equal and helpmate. Um, this was painted in the last year of Serrani's life. Uh, it is a portrait of Anna Maria Ragnuzzi Marsigli. And it's an allegory of charity as well as a portrait. And you can see uh, the drawing. Um, Serrani is very well known for her drawings with this very free and fluid, uh, almost like painting strokes, like uh, washes. And uh, so we have the drawing for this, and we can see that, the, that uh, this is a sketch. It's not uh, uh, slavishly copied. It's changed a bit into the uh, painting itself. Uh, she was the uh, sitter, was a Bolognese noblewoman, and she and her family did purchase uh, pictures by Serrani. Uh, what Serrani's done is a really interesting thing here. She's uh, done a kind of allegorical portrait. It's a portrait of a woman and her two children, but it's made into an allegory of charity. Now, charity was usually shown as a woman with multiple children, sometimes nursing a baby. Um, we are quite certain that this is what it is because remember that list of paintings that uh, Sarani did? She describes it in some detail. She names the sitters. Uh, she names the children, <laughs> uh, and so it's, uh, it was done in, in 1665. We're, you know, we're quite sure of that because it actually can be matched up with uh, one of the paintings uh, described in Nota della Pittura, which is her list of paintings, uh, which incidentally um, Malavizia preserves, copies it. Which is, uh, this is, as I said, one of her last works. She'd be about 27 when she dies. Uh, and she does a very free and thick brushwork. Um, she was regarded as a virtuoso in her time. The two children that you see, the, uh, the oldest child uh, is the one uh, standing in red uh, behind his mother's shoulder. 
and the youngest child, of course, is the baby uh, that uh, she's holding in her lap. Those are her two children. Those are the sitters, uh, Ana Maria's two children. Um, the oldest one is holding a citron, uh, which is a, cit a symbol of compassion. And uh, the, the, there is an extra figure sort of in the shadows, uh, uh, behind the baby, behind the other shoulder of the, the, the mother, uh, sort of dangling cherries uh, uh, to the baby. Um, the woman only had two children, but you need to have more than two children for, for the attributes of charity. So they've sort of added this, this, uh, uh, this uh, child as an extra. Uh, he's not uh, one of her actual children. And in the, um, the notes on painting, uh, Sarani says that she, she names the two children, then she says there's this other child who's teasing uh, Francesco Maria. Uh, so he's holding up the, the uh, cherries and the child's reaching for it. Just to show you a few other things uh, that I had uh, images of, just to show you. Um, I mentioned her drawing. Uh, we also have this uh, beautiful etching uh, of the Holy Family by Sorani. Uh, this is in the National Museum of uh, Women and the Arts, uh, the uh, Muse of Tragedy. And uh, you can see uh, somewhat classicizing uh, garments with the tragic mask and the book. And there are two paintings of Judith and Holofernes, Judith and the head of Holofernes, I should say, that are attributed to uh, Elisabetta Sarini. Uh, they're quite different than Artemisia's. Uh, they're quite different than Artemisia's uh, paintings of Judith. Uh, this one's in the Walters Art Gallery, uh, and you can see we have Judith, who is a delicate and gentle, serene uh, beauty, uh, without any blood on her clothing at all. Uh, she's holding the head of uh, Holofernes, so she's about to put him in the sack. Um, and she's not showing any particular uh, strong emotion. She's turned her head away from the decapitation, almost to say, well, I'm very ladylike, even if I am a heroine, even if I am a heroic woman, I should say. Uh, I'm very dainty. And she's turned her, she's turned her wet head away from the decapitation, uh, almost to say that she's very ladylike and dainty, even if she has saved her city uh, and is a heroic figure. Um, but she's not grimacing uh, the way Caravaggio's figure is, who I always think of saying, oh, I don't want to get any blood on my clothing or something like that. I have some details here to show you. Um, the color is gorgeous. You've got this rich kind of um, mulberry and blues and different shades of white and uh, the silver from the sword and hilt. Uh, and the brushwork is uh, kind of creamy. I guess that's a good word to use for it. Uh, you know, as I said, she was known as a virtuoso with her brushwork. And there's some more of the details. Uh, very different type of um, ha Judith with the head of Holofernes. Uh, in this one, uh, Judith is standing erect. Uh, she's lowering the head of Holofernes into the sack, and she seems to have uh, some, some servants around us. Or perhaps instead of lowering it, perhaps she's pulling it out of the sack. Uh, because you notice we've got the city behind us, so maybe this is Judith when she has returned to Betula, and she's pulling the head out uh, to display. Um, but she, she does look like a more powerful, less dainty figure than we, we saw previously. Uh, somewhat exotic kind of uh, clothing, however.